they have done, I would say, probably one of the ultimate sins a people can do against God. They committed adultery against God and worship false deities. They forsook the Lord. They took him for granted. As a result, 3,000 people died of unrepentive sin. And the rest, well, the rest were still dealing with the consequences of their idolatry. And in the midst of their mourning and repentance, what does God say to Moses and to the people of Israel? Well, he tells them, this is what we studied last week. God says, my calling on your lives still remain. Mercy and grace. Even though you've done these things, even though this has happened, yet you are confessing and you are repenting, and God says, my calling still remains on your life. But not only did God promise them the land, he once again reassures them that he would help them attain it. Look at Exodus 33, verse 2. God says, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite, the Hittite, the, the Pezrite, the Hivite, and the Jebusites. God says, hey, I am going to go before you still. And even, even though they were dealing with the consequence of their sin, God was still going to lead them, and God was still going to fight for them. However, there was still a consequence there was still something that they were going to have to deal with because God says to them, I will lead you, I will fight for you, but I will not go up in your midst. And I believe that God was testing the nation of Israel. He says, I'm going to go do this for you, but I'm not going to be with you in all of it. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the land, but my presence is not going to go with you. And I think God was testing them. God was going to give them the land, and God was going to fight their, their battles. But the one thing they were not going to have in their midst is that they were not going to have the presence of God himself. And God was wanting to see how the people were going to react to this news. And, and, and how do they respond? Well, there in verse 4, 33. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. I love this. See, what the people did was mourn this idea and thought of this potential loss of God's presence with them as they were going into the land of promise. The people mourned, but the people also repented. And what we find in this moment in the, the lives of the children of Israel is what we find is that their hearts were being reawakened, awakened to God. You know, in their mind is this, what good is the promised land if God's not with them? What good is having the angel of the Lord fight their battles, but in the end of it all, they don't have his presence? And their minds are thinking, well, we don't want it if we don't have the Lord himself. And we talked about this last week, that if we ever come to church, and as we worship and as we sing, as great as it may sound, as how the room amplifies the voices, what good is the worship? if the very presence of God is not with us. Listen, all it is is vain religion and religiosity. It is his presence in us and in our, the midst of our church that makes it come alive. You know, for several years, we met in a school. For seven years, we met every Sunday, we would set up, and we would tear down. How many guys remember those days? Anybody here were there with us? Yeah, many of you guys. There we were in the school. It was a school. It smelled like a school. There was kid trash all over the place. It was a school. Yet on Sundays, that auditorium became a church. Why? Because you showed up. And you prayed. And you worshiped. And the midst of it, of it all was God's very presence. That is what makes it. And so we see that as the people mourn and weep, this idea and thought of losing the presence of God God meets them in their brokenness, in their humility, in their confession, in their repentance. We look from verse 8 all the way down to verse 11 that God's presence comes to them, right? The people are surrounded at the tent of Moses, and they, they experience this incredible move of God's spirit as he comes and he hovers as a cloud, as a mist and smoke, and God's voice is speaking and moving, this pillar of cloud, and there God's glory comes. 
God's presence comes, God's voice comes, and he meets there with his people. And so what we learned last week was these three important things that, number one, Israel recognized their need for God's presence, but secondly, that they were willing to repent to seek God's presence. And lastly, they sought after God as God revealed himself to his people. And now on the heels of all that, we pick up today in verse 12. Look at verse 12 and 13. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now. Show me now your way that I might know you, that I might find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Guys, listen, you might have to read that a couple times to really grasp the magnitude of what Moses is saying. In fact, I would encourage you to mark that. I encourage you to mark verse 13 because it is very, very powerful and important for you and for me and for Moses. We want to mark it, but more importantly, I pray today that the Holy Spirit would use this passage to mark us in our hearts. Again, if we're going to walk closely with the Lord, if we're going to connect with him, it is more than simply getting the things that we request from God. It is more than our petition of prayer, and that is what Moses is saying. He says, above and beyond all of that, above all that we could ask from God, the one thing we desperately need is God alone. And that's what Moses is saying. God, we need you. We need your presence with us, amongst us, moving. So notice what Moses says there in verse 13. 13. He says, God, we need your grace in your sight. Notice that, your sight. He says that a number of times. We need to know your way. He says, we need to know you. He says, we acknowledge that we are your people. Those are the things that Moses is telling God that he needs. Your grace, your way, you, that we are your people. Moses acknowledged that what they needed was God himself. They desperately needed God's presence in their life. And, and here to me is the icing on the cake. The best news that Moses could hear there in verse 14 it says, and God said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. I love that. I'm going to come with you. God answers Moses with this beautiful answer that he is begging and confessing and asking God. And God says, I will go with you. And what we learn from God's answer to Moses is that it is in God's presence in our lives, which means that you and I can find and have the rest and peace we so desperately need in this life. Notice what he says again. Look at verse 14. And God says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. God's presence in our lives, what it means is that we can find and have rest and peace when he is with us. God gives us the comfort, the strength, the peace to be able to endure this life when he is with us, no matter what. Guys, I, I don't know about you, but you look at the world, and man, the world, the one thing the world desperately craves is this idea and thought of rest and peace. Just think about it. Most people's lives, they work their whole life towards the end of their work life, and what do they hope for after they're done working? Rest and peace. It's called retirement, right? That's the idea. You know, my dad was a firefighter for some 34 years for L.A. City. He was on the news multiple times. He, he fought giant fires in L.A. He was there during the, the Watts Riot fires, the Malibu fires, the Laguna fires, these giant fires, and he was on the front lines. And uh, through that, it wore on his body, and he had surgeries, heart attack, stroke from a stressful job. But the one thing, because of God's blessing on his life, he was able to retire young. He retired at 55 years old. And the rest of that time, he got busier than he ever was before. 
In fact, my dad has a saying. He goes, retirement, someone has to do it. So he does it. Why? There's this idea, you work your life, you work hard, and the idea is now I get to enjoy my life, rest and peace. And yet, the reality is though mankind searches for rest and peace, rarely do they find it in and of themselves, if not at all. Because this is something that can only truly come from God's presence in us and with us. Again, Rest and peace is only truly found when one comes into a real, a true, and sincere relationship with their creator and their God. It's with him that we find rest and peace. Now, let me dispel this idea of rest and peace with God that some may misunderstand. Rest and peace with God and his presence does not mean that we will be free from trouble Rest from God's presence does not mean that we will uh, be far removed from trial or hardships. Not at all. But what it does mean is that we can find and have rest and peace when he is in the midst of it all, both good and bad. Times of trial and hardship. That's what God does with us as we do this life. And this is so comforting for us to know in the midst of our trials, God will be with us. You guys recall the account of Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? You remember when those three friends were told to bow down before the, the idol that King Nebuchadnezzar raised up? And at the sound of the trumpet and the heart and the flute and all the, the instruments, that as they were going forth, that everyone was to bow down. And so they blew the trumpet and the shofar and all the noise, and everyone bowed down, yet three would not bend the knee, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king's like, hey, you have something wrong with your ears? Did you not hear the trumpets? You know, he calls them up, and, and uh, he goes, okay, I'm going to give you one more chance. Let's do this again. Ready, one, two, three, maestro. They start going. They're playing the song, and everyone bows down. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they stand there defiantly. He says, if you don't bend the knee, I will throw you into the fiery furnace. You will perish by fire, being burned to death. I can't think of a more horrendous way to die. And they refused. And they said, King, we're not going to bend the knee. We're not going to bend our knee. And whether God saves us or not, we will die without bended knee to your God. And so he blew the trumpet one more time. They refused. He threw some more logs in the furnace, get it a little bit hotter. They take them and they throw them into the fire. God did not save them from being burnt alive. They were thrown into the midst of the fire. They went in the fire. And yet what you read is this miraculous account of one standing with them in the midst, one that was like the son of man. Who is that? Jesus. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus thank you. Good answer. Jesus was with them in the fire. This is what God does for you and me as we go through life, hardship, pain, suffering, tears, and all, life and death, and that he goes with us through the fire. His presence, his spirit, his power. In the midst of social, political, cultural uprising against God and his word, he'll be with us. In the midst of an unknown future, God will be with us. Now, what I love is that as Moses is having this moment with God, again, on the heels of idolatry, on the heel of, of confession, repentance, on the heel of 3,000 people dying, he's having this, and the people are now repentive. They're asking for God's presence. God's spirit falls upon them. Moses cries out, God, we need you. We don't want to go to the promised land without you. And God says, I will go, and I will give you, I will give you rest, and I will give you peace. And you're thinking, well, okay, it's a done deal. Moses doesn't stop there. He keeps it going. Look what he says in verse 15 and 16. And Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, then do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known <coughs> that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people, and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Moses doesn't stop. God says, yeah, I'll go with you. And Moses just keeps going, okay, God, listen, if you don't go with us, 
then don't even, let, don't even take us in the promised land. Let us die right here in the wilderness because without you, we don't want to be in the promised land. And God's like, okay, I thought I already answered it. But then he goes a little bit even further. He goes, God, do this work that we might be unique for you. Unique people of God. And what we find is that Moses is crying out in desperation for God. Even though God already gave him the answer, the heart that we hear of Moses was desperation for God. I just want your blessing. I just want your your presence. We just want you. You know, there's another account like this in the Old Testament. You might recall when Jacob was coming back home to the land of Canaan after living for some 14 years with his uncle Laban. And he's coming back, and Esau is coming with like four or 500, 600 men, and he's afraid that Esau is going to come and bring revenge for stealing the birthright. And by this point in time, these guys were old men, older men, families, grandkids and all. And he's coming back, and he's fearful. He's trying to manipulate. He's breaking up them into groups, trying to figure out the best way to survive. And that night, an angel of the Lord met Jacob there, and they rustled all night. I love that passage because I love rustling. I like jujitsu. And they're going at it, and they're going back and forth. And Jacob, man, is fighting the Lord, this angel of the Lord, with all his might, with all his strength. And finally, it's like the angel of the Lord is like, okay, like we're done. And he touched his hip. And something happened. And his hip popped out or what? He busted a hip. And, and at the end of this all, Jacob has no more strength, but he's holding on to this angel. And he says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And he knew this was the Lord that he's wrestling with. God, I don't want to let you go. Just bless me. Just bless my life. Just be with me. I need your blessing with me and my family. And the Lord blesses Jacob. And there he changes his name from being Jacob, the heel catcher and deceiver, to Israel, a man governed by God. That desperation that we read about Jacob is the same language and tone that you find with Moses right here with God. God, we don't want anything unless you're there. We don't want the promised land unless you're with us. God, God, we want your blessing, we want your presence, that we might be different than all the people on the face of the earth. And without your presence, we will not be different. Without you, that's impossible. Again, more than the line of promise, more than your angel fighting for us, God, we need you. And look what he says in verse 16 again. This is key and important. He says, so shall, and so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. This is what's going to make the nation of Israel different. God's presence. This is what's going to make Israel unique from all the other people in the entire world from all the false religious systems, from all the different monarchies and dictators and and polytheists and all of them, it was God's presence with them. And this is so true for the church today. This is so true for your life today, my life, that if God is real in your life and God is working in your life, then you ought to be different than the world. Your disposition should be different. Your attitude should be different. The way you think and process politics should be different. The way your work ethic is at your job should be different than everyone else in the world because you have the very presence of God working, living, dwelling, and leading your life. Well, is it different? Are you different? Is your marriage different than the way the world is? Is your parenting different than the way the world is? Your friendships, the way you do your job? Guys, I would say this. One of the most important things in the life of a real, true Christian is just their disposition. Like, what kind of face do you carry? What kind of face do you have? Now, ladies, I'm not saying the makeup face you put on. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, you know, you wake up in the morning, you're like, you know, put a little blush, a little, you know, crimp the, put the eyelashes. That's, that's like the cool thing. I could put, put extended eyelashes on there, and you look all good, you know what I'm saying? 
The disposition is the character. Do, do, does, is the spirit of God flowing through your life? Is there joy and peace and, and, and contentment and blessing? Does that come from you? Because if it doesn't, you've got to ask yourself, well, why? Because what Moses is saying, God, with you and your presence, you make us separate than everyone else in the world. And this is what, what happens in the life of a believer that is walking closely with the Lord, is that there is something in them that is so distinct. Their joy, their peace, their smile. It reflects the Shekinah glory of God. It comes in you and through you to everyone around you. And that's what we're going to see happen with Moses. God, Moses is going to stand before the Lord. The glory, the Shekinah glory of God is going to fall upon Moses. And Moses is going to come down the mountain. And the people are going to freak out. Why? Because he's radiating the glory of God. And the people are like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? You are like that glow. Remember that glow bug back in like the 80s or whatever that you would give to your kids and you would squeeze it and it would sing or something and its face would light up? That's Moses. He's like the, the human glow bug. He's coming down the mountain. His face is radiating the glory of God. The people were so freaked out, they like made him put a veil on. Like, bro, cover that thing up. That's weird. But all he was, all he was doing was radiating the glory of God. Guys, is your life radiating the glory of God? Because it should. The Holy Spirit should be working in you and through you. The fruits of the Holy Spirit coming from your life. Man, that is what you need to pray for deeply about God. Let your spirit work in me and through me. You know, there's, I, I, now there's nothing worse than like a pessimistic, negative Christian. <laughs> They're saved, forgiven, and redeemed, but they look at life as if everything's a bummer. It's like Eeyore. You know, when you're around Eeyore, you can't get help but get bummed out. How, how's your day going? Oh, I guess okay. Well, the sun's out. Don't you like it? Yeah, but... We know hail's going to come around the corner, right? The rain's coming. And, and, and it's like, oh, it's a bummer. Guys, don't be that kind of Christian. You know, it's been said there are only two types of Christians, those that are blessings when they come and those that are blessings when they go, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> right? It's like some people you just want to avoid because you know that when we start talking, just negative, negative, negative. But there are other Christians that you just look at and you just go, man, they are such a blessing, such a joy. You know, I always give this illustration, that, I, that, that joke of people being a blessing when they come and when they go. And there was always this one Christian that I, when I think of that, I always thought of them. Because every time I would see them, it would put a smile on my face. Because I know the moment I talk with them, the only thing coming out of their mouth is the word of God, blessing, encouragement, prayer. You know, guys, I mentioned just... A week ago, one of the assistant pastors at, at Calvary Aurora died suddenly. Pastor Avant Ramsey. I'm, anybody got any of your new Pastor Avant? Yeah, I, I've known him for a very long time, just about 20 years or so. And he was one of those Christians. In fact, every time I thought of this Christian that's a blessing when they come, he was the person I would think of. Because every time I would see him, every time, there would be a word of encouragement and a word of blessing come from his mouth. Hey, let me pray for you, Louie. And it would just be a blessing. How does that happen in our life? Through the very presence of God working in and through us. So again, Moses acknowledged that they would be distinct by God's presence. God wants to make us distinct, changed. We understand that it's his presence, his very word working in us and through us, that people will see God working and moving in our, in our midst. And we live differently because of God's presence working in and through our life. Look what he says in verse 17. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I will know you by name. Guys, you know, sometimes we read passage scriptures like this, and we can just read over them. But you have to ponder the heart and thought behind it. God reassures Moses that his presence would come, that he would go on behalf of the people, that in their repentance confession, 
and the cry of their heart for God's presence, God says, I will do what you have asked. I will do this very thing. And at the end of it all, look what he says. I love what God says. He says, and I will know you by name. Now, when he says know you by name, he's not speaking of Moses. He's speaking of the nation. I will know them by name. In other words, God didn't want to be this far, distant, reaching deity, but rather an intimate, personal relationship with their creator and God. I will know you by name name. It is personal. It is relational. It is very real. I will know you by name. And so Moses, he responds, verse 18, and Moses said, please show me your glory. Again, guys, uh, we're reading these bits at a time, and it's kind of hard maybe as we're reading it to get the flow, but there is a back and forth going on between Moses and God. Moses crying out, God, uh, God, we need your presence. God says, I'll give you my presence. Oh, God, but we, we need, if you, don't, if you don't give us your presence, then we don't even want to go in the land of promise. Yes, I'll give you my presence. But God, listen, we need your presence because if we don't have your presence, we're not going to be unique, distinct, and God, I will answer you. I will, I, will, I will give you my presence, and I will know you by name. And then after that, Moses responds to God, God, show me your glory. Show us your glory. I want more of you. That's the heart of Moses for him and the people. Again, God, we need your presence. God's response, yes, I'll give it. God, we need you to make a difference. God's response, yes, I will, I will give it. And at, at, in all of this, Moses wanted more. He wanted more. He says, God, show us your glory. What you find in the heart of Moses was a man who was hungry for more of God. He wanted more. And, and, and I, as I read this and I was studying this the last few days, uh, be, with all honesty, there was a, a moment of great conviction in my own life, my own heart, saying, am I as hungry for the Lord as I should? Do I crave his word as I so often crave donuts? <laughs> Do I think about it? Do I want that you think of that In-N-Out burger and your mouth starts watering and, you know, dripping with cheese and grease and you're thinking, I want that. I crave that. Or maybe a refreshing soda or something that, to the effect in which your body craves. Moses was craving after the Lord. I want more. And I thought to myself, man, when was the last time I really prayed, God, I want more of you? It's convicting. Now, you stop and think of this man, Moses. What kind of interaction did Moses already have with God? Well, unique, one of a kind. I mean, what kind of, how many people can say they were hanging out with God for 40 days and God was speaking to them and God wrote the commands on a tablet and Moses was there with God? Uh, no one. He's one of the most unique men in the world to have experienced God in such a personal, intimate, and, and close way. He saw God as a flaming bush, right? He's there on the mount of God, in God's presence. And yet, even after all those personal encounters, even after all of that, Moses is telling God, I want more of you. To know more of his word, to know more of his promises, to, more, to know more of his spirit and power, to know more of him. And Moses' conclusion in this interaction is, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Now you have to think, okay, what's going to happen now? Show me your glory. Like, okay, what's God going to do? What else could God possibly do to do more for Moses, to do more? Because oftentimes I think that's what holds us back. From our, each of us, individually, asking God to show us more. Well, what else could God do? What else would God do? Well, that's the level of faith that we need to pray for. God, do more. Work more. So look what happens, verse 19. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Again, I love this. Moses cries out to God. God says, I will make my goodness pass before you. 
And you know what this shows us? This is really kind of key. Is that God's glory lies in his goodness. Because I think oftentimes you and I, we, we want the miraculous. We want the lightning and the thunder and the smoke and the earthquake. There's all these supernatural things that we want for God's glory to be revealed to us. And what God tells Moses is this, I will, I will bring my glory to you, but my glory is found in my goodness. The goodness of God reveals his glory. That's a word for some of us today. We need to find greater rest in the goodness of God's graciousness and his mercy. This is what we need to do, to be reminded of how good God has been to us, to you, his mercy in your life, his grace in your life, his patience in your life. I love Psalm, Psalm 34, verse 8, where David writes, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. As you learn to trust in the Lord, we experience his goodness and his glory. And for some of us, we're not tasting the Lord as we should because we're not pursuing him as we should. And we're missing out on the goodness of God. And I, and I, and I think of this when, when, when Moses says, show me your glory, of all the ways for God to do this, of all the ways for this to happen, show his magnificent justice, the justice of God, or the tremendous power of God, or the, the wrath of God, or the judgments of God. Instead, what God does is he shows Moses a greater part of the goodness of his presence. The goodness of God. Look at verse 20, all the way down to verse 23 as we wrap up this morning. In verse 20, it says, But God said to him, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And it shall be that while my glory passes by, that I will put you into the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face you shall not see. So here God is going to reveal his glory and the goodness of his glory to Moses. And he does this only in part. You have to understand, this is done in part. But what it would seem as if this would be a, a, a very unique experience that Moses has with God. This is a very unique moment of revelation with God to Moses. So what does God do? God prepares Moses, right? He prepares him for this moment. He, he gives Moses a specific place to stand and to be this cleft of the rock. But then God intervenes with Moses. He uses his hand, right? Now, did God have a big, giant hand? Did God go come down with this big, giant hand from heaven, come down? No, guys, listen, that's, that's an anthropomorphism, right? We've talked about this. And anthropomorphism is a, a way in which we use human description to understand the move and work of God, Right? So God covers him with his hand. But then what we find is that God's glory is tempered. God's glory passes. God's glory is, if you will, is lightened in order for Moses to experience this unique revelation from God. He says, I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see, right? Now, again, he's not showing him his back. God does not have a physical back. God's spirit. Uh, one of the ways I, I've read about this as I was studying this that was you describe this moment is a comet in the sky. Anybody see a meteor falling from the sky or a comet? You know, you can see it falling. But what you're actually witnessing is, is, is not the, the physical comet falling, but the, the trail effects of that moment in which that comet or that meteor passed, and you'll see a flash of light. With the comet, you'll see the tail of the comet, and you'll see some heat or, or, or something radiating from behind it. It's the after effects of that comet shooting through the sky. Well, that's what's happening here with God's glory. God comes and he 
passes by and Moses sees the radiance of God's glory pass. Again, this was the minimal uh, ability for Moses to be able to handle. Um, God was revealing to Moses, but also concealing himself. God was blessing Moses, but also protecting Moses. Why? Because he couldn't see the glory of God and live. God's reward to Moses was to see him as much as humanly possible. And it was just a fraction of the radiance of the glory of God. He couldn't stand in God's presence. It's impossible. It would be like you today standing a mile away from the sun. You would be consumed. You could not see it. You could not squint at it. Your body could not handle it. You would be absolutely consumed by the glory, power, radiation, and everything else that would happen if you stood in front of the sun just a mile away. That is a great illustration to think of being in the presence of God. It's impossible. But he gives them a little bit. Why? Why would God do this for Moses? Because Moses was a man that was desperately seeking the presence of God. And I don't believe that you and I are further away than Moses to be able to see the glory and presence of God today in our lives. And this is my prayer that we would see the glory of God. That that when we come to church, we would be desperate for his presence. Desperate to hear his voice, not some man's voice, but God's voice. That the word of God would become alive as the word says. It's living and active, cutting to the heart. For some of us, man, our hearts are a little hard. And God needs to cut away those areas of our flesh. Moses wants to see the glory of God, and God reveals himself. And here's what I want you to understand. And this might be hard to grasp. How many of you say, maybe by raising up your hand, interaction time, okay, that you would have liked to experience what Moses experienced with God? Anybody? I would. But here's what you need to understand. Even with what Moses experienced, it does not compare to the revelation that God has shown you and me through Jesus Christ. That's hard to grasp. John 1.14 says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to see the glory of God today, don't look any further than Jesus himself and what he has done for us upon the cross. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and I love this, and you have to really pray through this idea, this concept. But 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says this, He says, but we all, with unveiled faces, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Today, you and I experience something that Moses never had, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. Think about this. All the Old Testament saints never experienced the infilling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as you and I experience that today. And yet, we so often think, God's not working in my life. If you feel that way today, it is because you are not as Moses, a man that is desperate for God's presence. And maybe that's what needs to change. Tomorrow, your alarm is going to go off and you're going to have to go to work. Another day, another dollar. But start it with God in his presence. Open up your Bible. Pray. Worship with your knees on the ground. Ask for more of his presence in your life. I promise you make that the daily cry of your heart. God will begin to move and work in a way that maybe you've never seen before. Just as he began, he did a new work with Moses in a way that Moses never saw God before. So it applies to you and me. God's glory 
will always have a transformative work in the life of the individual who sees it. It'll always change you. Next week, when we are in Exodus chapter 34, we're going to see how it changed Moses. And how if you and I truly seek after the Lord, it ought to change us. And when we leave, that we leave with the glory of God radiating from us to the people around us, to the world. Isn't that what you hope for? I hope that's what you pray for in your life. God working in you, that as you leave, God will work through you. Because that's the heart of God for his church.